The patient is positioned supine on the operating table with a bump under the ipsilateral hip so as to intermurotate the leg. This allows good visualization of the lateral aspect of the foot. Next, the incision is marked on the foot by identifying the appropriate anatomy. The incision runs from the tip of the lateral malleolus to the base of the fourth metatarsal. The incision has been clearly marked on this foot. If the surface anatomy is difficult to identify, an image intensifier can be used to identify the relevant anatomical structures. Make sure the foot is at the edge of the table as this will assist when inserting the hardware and help with better visualization of the surgical field. The skin incision is then made over the marking. It's not necessary to use the full extent of the marking for an isolated subtalar fusion. If the calcaneal cuboid joint needs to be added, the incision can be extended to the base of the fourth metatarsal. Careful dissection is made through the soft tissue, protecting all relevant neurovascular structures. It is important to maintain hemostasis while dissecting using diathermy. Once the extensor digitorum brevis muscle is identified, it needs to be carefully dissected out. In the younger patient, this muscle is quite well developed and defined, and definitely worth dissecting out. In the elderly patient, this muscle is often atrophied, and it's easier just to split the muscle belly in half to gain access to the subtalar joint. In this case, we have a well-developed muscle belly, which we are carefully dissecting out, so as to identify the edges and the origin of the extensor digitorum brevis muscle. The muscle is then released from its origin and dissected subperiosteally off the calcaneus. The muscle is released all the way to the calcaneal cuboid joint, which you can visualize here. The muscle belly is then reflected distally and sutured to the distal skin so as to take it out of the surgical field and improve visualization of the subtalar joint. The peroneal tendons are then identified in the proximal aspect of the incision. It's very important to do this carefully as it's very easy to cut these tendons. Once the peroneal tendons have been identified, a sharp home and retractor is inserted medial to the peroneal tendons as well as the CFL ligament going around the posterior aspect of the subtalar joint. The capsule of the posterior facet is then incised, exposing the subtalar joint. The use of self-retaining retractors is helpful in maintaining the exposure of the surgical field. The subtalar joint is then identified and as you can see it's quite a tight space to work in. Using a sharp osteotome or chisel, the lateral half of the posterior facet is denuded of its cartilage. A spine curette is a great instrument for removing debris in these tight joints. By removing the lateral half of the cartilage, we have now made space to insert a smooth laminar spreader. The laminar spreader is first placed in the anterior half of the joint and opened up. Now we can start better visualizing the full extent of the posterior facet. It is important to meticulously remove all debris from inside the joint. With good visualization of the posterior facet, the osteotome or chisel is now used to denude the remaining cartilage and remove any sclerotic bone from the joint surfaces. It is important to get down to healthy bleeding subchondral bone. Take your time in preparing the joint surfaces as this is a critical part of achieving a successful fusion. Make sure to clean right across to the middle edge of the posterior facet. Be cautious when working in the posterior medial aspect of the joint as the FHL tendon runs in this area. With the sharp osteotome, it's very easy to damage the tendon. To confirm that you have cleaned to the middle edge of the joint, there's often a small posterior medial fragment which is visualized here. This fragment needs to be removed. Once it's removed, the FHL tendon will become visible in the depths. Once the FHL can becomes visible, you can be confident that you've cleaned the full extent of the joint. For the purpose of this video, we have used a spine curette to demonstrate the FHL tendon in the posterior medial corner of the joint. The joint is washed out with copious amounts of normal saline to remove all the small debris. Now that we are happy with the preparation of the posterior half of the joint, 
a laminar spread is inserted posteriorly and the anterior one is removed. The anterior half of the joint is now prepared in the same manner with osteotomes and curettes. At this stage we've only really addressed the posterior facet. To visualize the middle and anterior facet, the sinus tarsus area has to be debrided. The soft tissue is carefully removed using sharp dissection. Once the middle and anterior facets become visible, they can be prepared in a similar fashion using sharp osteotomes and curettes. Once we are happy that we denuded the entire joint of cartilage and sclerotic bone down to healthy bleeding subchondral bone, the joint is washed out once again with copious amounts of normal saline for the last time. A sharp 3.5mm drill bit is then used to perforate the prepared joint surfaces. The reason for doing this is to form channels which allow marrow elements to access the fusion site. This aids in achieving a successful bony fusion. Make sure to drill both the calcaneal and talus side of the joint surface. The reason for using a drill bit rather than a K-wire is that the flutes of the drill bit bring healthy cancellous bone into the fusion site. Swap the laminar spreaders around again so that the posterior half of the joint can now be drilled. In cases with very sclerotic subchondral bone, a thin sharp osteotome can be used to feather the joint surfaces. This is done to try and improve the success of the fusion. We are now ready to insert the hardware fixation. The screws are inserted through the posterior aspect of the heel. It's very important to make sure that these are inserted off the weight bearing surface. Here we can see a hand placed on the plantar aspect of the foot and the incision made proximal to it so as to avoid the hardware being on the weight bearing surface. As you can see the laminar spreader has been left in situ. This is done so that we can visualize the placement of our K wires. The first wire is placed in the lateral half of the calcaneus, aiming into the mid-substance of the posterior facet. A second wire is placed in the medial half of the calcaneus, aiming slightly more anteriorly so as to engage the neck of the talus. The use of an ACL K-wire guide can be very helpful in the placement of these K-wires. Once you are happy with the position of your K-wires, the laminar spreader can be removed. The subtalar joint is then reduced. Take your time in reducing the joint and make sure that it's in an anatomical position of approximately 5 to 10 degrees of valgus. Once you're happy with the reduction, your assistant can drive the K-wires up into the talus. Alignment can be checked visually by lifting up the leg and confirming that the heel is in approximately 5 to 10 degrees of valgus relative to the lower leg. Correct placement of the K-wires is checked under fluoroscopy, both on the AP and lateral views. Once you're happy with the reduction and placement of your K-wires, the screw lengths can be measured. It's advisable to minus approximately 5mm from the measured length so as not to penetrate the ankle joint. We prefer to use a 7.5mm cannulated headless compression screw system so as to minimize hardware prominence which could cause discomfort for the patient with shoe wear and impact activities. The system shown here is from Acumed and it's an AccuTrack 2 7.5 headless compression screw. Any compression screw of similar size can be used. Fluoroscopy is once again used to confirm correct position and length of the screws inserted. It's also good to check that good compression has been achieved across the fusion site. The extensor digitorum brevis muscle is now reattached to its origin using interrupted absorbable vicral sutures. The 
wound is then carefully closed in layers using absorbable vital sutures. We prefer doing interrupted rather than running sutures. We prefer to close the skin with an absorbable subcuticular self-locking barbed suture. This specific uh, suture requires that the incision be closed from the middle in both directions. The two suture ends are then pulled apart, thus tensioning the suture and locking the incision. The ends are then cut flush with the skin. We have found the suture to be safe and effective with good cosmetic results. It is important not to forget the wound at the back of the heel, which we close with interrupted nylon sutures. The leg is then immobilized in a well padded below knee plaster cast with the ankle in a neutral position. It is advisable to elevate the leg so as to minimize post operative swelling.